The cool thing about having conferences like this is that <clears throat> when you have a multitude of different speakers, everybody has their own different story and perspective and how things operate. So you've got like the science, like people that are just pure science, and you have people that are like woo, and then you've got people that are in the middle, you've got open-minded people, and you've got people who have like their box of what they think Sasquatch fits into. Well, the cool thing about this is everyone has their own different story, so you get to see different perspectives from everybody. And uh, my story is like a little bit different, I guess you could say, because I started off with the weird stuff first and then moved into the uh, seeing things. But I had my first sighting in 1985 in my bedroom when I was eight years old. And I was laying in bed one night and uh, it wasn't during the night, it was like, sun was going down, so it was probably, I don't know, nine o'clock or so in the summertime. And I was laying in my bed and I opened up my eyes because I heard something and a little one, like a little guy, popped up from the other side of my dresser and smiled and laughed at me. And it scared me to death. And I cried and uh, I don't know, like, I tried telling my parents about it, they didn't believe me. And I said, all right, whatever, that's just your imagination. So I said, okay, whatever. So I kind of tucked it, tucked it away, you know, because, like, how do you explain that type of thing to people? I don't know. So that was the same year that we moved into a new house, and uh, we met our neighbors, and our neighbors had a cabin in Canada. And that year they invited us to the cabin, and I was like, cool. So that year we went to the cabin, and... Um, Pretty much from that time on, this was in 1985, like I said, weird stuff always happened when we were up there. Like, um, you'd see, we'd see like balls of light in the woods, orbs or whatever you want to call it. We'd hear crazy screams. Uh, the cabin would always get slapped, no matter what room you were in, you know? Especially at night when you're trying to sleep. You'd be sleeping all of a sudden, like right behind your head, you'd just hear like, whap. And, um, I could go on for an hour alone about all the weird stuff that we experienced up there. But, so that kind of like always left me open to, I don't even know, like there's just no ending to the possibilities of things that can be out there. So I grew up in the Washington DC area as like a, just a city kid, you know, suburban city kid, skateboarding, um, playing sports, going to like shows and concerts and stuff like that. So, and then I also grew up like kind of in, with like a rough crowd, I guess you could say. So any talk about that type of stuff within that circle was always met with like, like, come on, man, like that's not real. So I always had to like tuck that away. And also living in the city, you can't really like, you just have to keep that stuff kind of tucked away. It just didn't, responded to well growing up. So I kind of convinced myself that I didn't believe in this stuff. Like, I don't know what that is, but it's, it's nothing. It's not real. It's whatever. So the older I got and the more these things started happening, every time I'd go there, I'd be like, okay, I can't, I can't ignore this stuff anymore. This stuff's real. This stuff happens. So in 2012, I, uh, I was like, determined to get over the fact that every time I went to this place, it would like scare me. Like I'd go out in the woods and I'd go for a walk and this was on about 5,000 acres of private land surrounded by um, provincial land. And um, you'd just be walking through the woods and you just get like this feeling of fear and dread. And I couldn't explain it, didn't know where it came from, but you just feel it like in your chest, you know? And uh, so I would stop and I would walk away and, and you'd walk a little bit back and that feeling would go away. So after a while, you kind of have to just come to grips with it. You're either gonna live your life being scared all the time in these situations or you're just gonna have to grip with it. So 2012, I decided I'm gonna deal with this. So one night after dinner, I went out to go camping by myself. And uh, if you know anything about like the Canadian wilderness, there's many other things out there besides cryptids that you have to worry about. And this was in October, so there's moose and rut, 
Uh, there's wolves, there's bears, there's wolverines, there's all sorts of things you kind of have to keep, keep an eye on. So I was a little on edge, a little nervous, but I was like, I'm going to go to this place that I always get this fear feeling from, that I'm always scared. So I'm going to go there and I'm going to push through this. This is going to be my goal. So I went out there and I set up my camp. So it's like I strung my hammock out. And uh, this was probably about, I think it was about 9.30 or 10 by the time I got everything set up. And uh, so I get in my hammock and there's, uh, there's wolves, there's two separate wolf packs that are on this, in this area. And there's one on the north side of the lake and there's one on the south side of the lake. So I was listening to the wolf, wolf packs howl. And uh, so I'm just sitting there in my hammock, like trying to get comfortable, listening to the wolves, just like, like soaking everything up. A tree fell behind me, just got pushed over, and, you know. And uh, just going by previous things happening at the cabin like that, this stuff just happened. So I knew somebody was here, I knew somebody was there. I said, okay, cool, something's gonna happen tonight. So I calmed myself down, and um, while I was laying there, I fell asleep, and I was woken up about, I wanna say it was about one in the morning with a finger touching my head right here. And I woke up, and as, as soon as I woke up and realized what was happening, this like rush of energy shot through my body, from my head to my feet, and it was like this, I don't really know how to explain it, it was like hot, cold, every emotion in your body just triggering at once, just poof, and I was like, whoa, what was that? And then there was like a message, and it said, get out of here. And I was like, okay, you're just freaking yourself out. This is why we're here. Let's push through this. This is the fear thing. You're just making this stuff up. So I was like, all right, cool. So I calmed myself down again, and it happened again. But this time it was like more intense. It just came through me. And I was like, and it said, get out of here now. I was like, okay. You're just freaking yourself out. You know, calm down. You'll get through this. And then it happened again. But this time it happened real hard. And you could feel it. It like went through every cell in my body. And then the message said, get out of here now or you're going to die. And I was like, okay. And then I had a, like a two-way radio in the pouch in my hammock that I was conversing with my dad who was about a mile away in the cabin. And my two-way radio started going and I was like, all right, this is not cool anymore. So I jumped up and I ran to my boat and I took off and I'm going down the lake in the boat and it was like a crystal clear sky. There was a moon, but no clouds or nothing. And so I'm just like in the moonlight for about a 20 minute boat ride. And that was the most vulnerable I've ever felt in my life. Like I just was waiting for something to come out of the sky and pluck me up. I don't know why, I don't know how to explain that part, but it just felt like something was about to come grab me. But I got to the cabin, I went up, got in my room, went to sleep. It was fine. So, that was my first, like, like, what the hell was that experience, you know? And then, I was living here in Georgia at the time. Um, I grew up in D.C., but I moved to Georgia in 2007. And uh, I lived right down the street from here, about 10 minutes from here. And at this time this happened, I was living there. So when I got back, I was like, after all the experiences that had happened at the cabin, you know, like hearing footsteps, having the cabin be slapped and, and all this stuff happening, I was like, all right, I'm going to look into this more because there's just way more to this. And I wasn't convinced that I was just imagining this stuff anymore. So I went to, you know, the internet, tried to find some things. But there wasn't people that I could relate to because my story didn't match up with, like, investigators and researchers and people that I was, like, seeing on the internet. So it was kind of like a hard road for me to start on, which is why these kind of conferences are awesome because you can talk to people and meet people and then you can like find the person that you relate to the most because not everybody's story is the same. So I started like you know reaching out and, and looking and that's actually when I stumbled across Alex Midnight Walker's blog talk radio show. I started listening to that. I started finding some things that like I could relate to. And then he had a conference in 2014, I think, up in the North Georgia mountains near uh, Dahlonega, wasn't it? 
Yeah. And um, so I met some people, and it was, it was nice to finally like, talk to a few people who had had some of the weird stuff happen too, and I was like, cool. So one day I was out riding my mountain bike, um, and so I'm riding down the trail. I come across some, uh, I'm a few miles down the trail, I come across the power lines, I get into an area, and I just get that feeling again. Like, you can just feel the energy is just different, and you're like, all right, cool. This, it's like the air gets thicker, it kind of weighs on you, it feels kind of heavy in a way. So I'm like, all right, this place is weird. You feel like you're getting watched, and you're like, you just feel like you're being watched. It's like that feeling. So, kind of, you know, push through, I go home and think about it, and it's like as soon as I crossed the power lines going out of that area, that feeling went away. It's the same thing. I'm like, okay, well, there's something to this. So I start investigating that area more. Like, why is it that some areas you don't feel these things, and then you go into other areas and you feel them? It's just like very prevalent. So I started to research this area a little more, and I started finding like these tree, these tree structures. This is a, this is one pine tree. It was about a 30 foot pine tree that was broken in half. And it was, you know, snapped in half and then laid in an X. But the, the thing about it is the middle, the middle of it is it has vines that are wrapped around it to tie it in place. I mean, this thing is like, like, you know, that big. It's not anything that a person could do without some kind of like a, a boom crane or something. But this was not in any kind of area where you can even get equipment like that in. And, sorry, these are kind of, so this is another end of it. But you can kind of see the vines are wrapped around it to hold it in place. And that's another end of it, where it was wedged up between two trees and then the vines were wrapped around it to hold it in place. Excuse me. So um, I started seeing this and this was, in the same area that I was starting to get those feelings at. And uh, so I was like, and then just finding stuff like this, just, just things that, you know, that could be possibly, I guess, to fall like that, but the chances of things like that happening are, I don't know. So one day, my kids and my wife wanted to go for a hike. So I was like, all right, cool, let's go to this place. So we go to this place. and. Um, I was like, I just want to get, a, you know, an affirmation that this isn't just me. So we go for the hike. We hike about, uh, I think it's like three or four miles back in this place. We cross over the power lines. I didn't say anything to anybody in the family about this. So we cross over the power lines. As soon as we get to the other side, we walk about two minutes in, and my wife stopped me, and she said, I don't like this place. And I was like, oh, yeah. And she was like, it's got a weird feeling to it. And I said, all right, cool. It's not just me. And I was like, all right, well, let's just walk through this. So we start walking, and the trail kind of loops around. So we get to where it starts to loop, and I was with my, uh, my son and one of my sons, and my wife was with my other son. And she stops me, and she says, hey, babe, stop for a second. I was like, so I stopped. She's like, there's somebody walking behind us. And I was like, I know I heard it, because you could just hear the footsteps. And it crunch, crunch, crunch. And uh. And I said, all right, well, she's like, but I don't see anybody. And I was like, all right, well, just walk with me. You know, we'll be fine. So we walked, and it followed us. The footsteps followed us the whole time we were back there for about 30, 45 minutes. And then all of a sudden, this blue jay comes out and just starts harassing us, like chasing us around. It's just yelling at us the whole time. She's like, what's up with this blue jay? I'm like, I don't, I don't know. Like, it's just talking to us, you know? It's just not happy that we're here. So anyways, we walk out, and then we cross the path loops around, we crossed the power lines again, and we got out to the other side, that feeling went away. And we were just like, back to normal. And she was like, okay, I don't wanna come back here again. And I was like, okay, that's fine. I'm not gonna push you through this. <clears throat> so I was like, in my head, I was like, okay, this is my place now. I'm gonna start coming back here and find out what's going on here. So I kept going back and kept going back, kept going back, and I kept seeing more and more structures. Every time I would go back, it could, kept seeing these arches and bends, um, just X's, and just every time I'd go back, there would be more stuff. And this is, this is here, by the way. This is here in West Georgia. This is within 30 minutes of where we're standing right now. So I just keep going back, keep going back. So I go back one day, and um, 
I'm just looking at the structures and I say to myself like, I'm just gonna talk out loud and talk to whoever's out there listening to me and if I'm just gonna compliment their structures. You know, I'm just gonna speak very nicely and I didn't have any fear, I wasn't scared anymore because I'd already experienced like as scared as you could be from my previous experience because I was like the most scared you could ever be. So I was like, if I could survive that, I could survive anything, you know what I mean? Like the worst thing that can happen after that is I guess dying, but I don't even know if that's a bad thing to be honest. So I'm walking through and I'm just talking, I'm like, Oh, I really like what you guys did with this structure. Like, oh, this is cool. I don't know how you did this, you know, and there's nobody around, so I didn't feel like silly talking to myself, you know, whatever. So I'm like explaining all these things. I'm like, I really love how you did this. About 20 minutes later, I hear footsteps coming from behind me, again, in the leaf litter, like crunch, crunch, crunch. And I'm like, I turn around, I don't see anybody. So I'm like, okay, somebody's here. I don't know who or what. And then, crunch, crunch, crunch from over here. And I was like, all right, who's over there? And every time I would turn and look, another from over here came, and crunch, crunch, crunch in the leaves. So every time I would look, the one from behind me would walk closer and closer and closer. So eventually they were within probably to where, where you are around me. Here's the thing though, I could hear their footsteps, I could see their footsteps in the leaves and I could smell them but I could not see them, and they were standing right there. So while I'm standing there, trying to figure out what's going on, it gets totally quiet. And then all of a sudden, this like wave of like love is the only thing I can explain it. It was like this euphoric love, like almost like an, if you could take a warm energy hug and just like put it in a bubble around you and just absorb it, it just came in hard, and it was just super overwhelming. The same as the fear experience, but it was like a love experience. And it was just like a, a gratitude, loving experience. And I was like, it kind of brought me to tears. It made me happy and sad, and it was like the opposite of what I experienced in Canada. So I stood there, and I just soaked it up. And as soon as, like, it was probably about, 30 seconds to a minute, and then it ended, and there was a message, and it said, you can go now. And I said, all right, and I left. And I thanked, you know, I thanked whoever for everything. Well, being that I hadn't seen one in this location yet, I didn't know what was going on. So, like I said, when I went to this other, when I started going to conferences trying to figure out, like I was having a hard time connecting with people. So, Eventually, when I met up with everybody that, you know, it's like some of the people that are here and they kind of understand what I was going through, it was like such a relief to me. So I just, like, that's such an important thing for conferences like this. Um, it's just finding the people that you connect with because it's not like people are wrong and there's nothing that's like right. It's not like the, the science only guys are on, like right and the woo people are right. It's like, it's both. Like, it's a combination of both. Like, we all have our different stories. So I can tell you what they can do because from my personal experiences, but I can't tell you what they can't do because nobody knows what their limits are except for them. And so if you hear people telling you they don't do that, that's not true. If you hear people saying they can't do that, that's not necessarily true. You don't really know what their limits are. So you kind of have to open yourself to any possibility. And I had to learn that through my experiences. So I'm never gonna tell anybody that they're wrong unless they, I don't know, if, I guess I should reframe that because there are some things that I'll say that's not true. I don't think they're monsters and they're not out in the woods to kill people. That, that whole uh, premise that people like to push the fear thing uh, to like for YouTube videos and movies and this and that, that stuff's garbage. That's not how it is. If you go into the woods with respect and you treat them with respect and you act like you're a stranger in somebody else's house, they're gonna reciprocate that back to you. They're not gonna just go out and you know beat you up because you're walking through the woods. Like that, that whole thing that people are trying to push, that's wrong. 
if you go out there trying to shoot them or something like that, or you um, come too close to like a young one or uh, try to harm something, or something you're probably going to regret that real quick, but they're no different than us when it comes to that. They're going to protect themselves if they need to. But uh, anyways, I go off on tangents sometimes. Um, so when I started connecting with people that I could relate to, we started, you know, I could go out with people and meet new people and go do experience new things. And that's when um, I started to see them more. And then when you start to see them, you can kind of go back in time and be like, you can relate to experiences that happened before and be like, oh wow, okay, so I remember that happened like 10 years ago. And that was obviously, you know, you just put the, you start putting the pieces together like a puzzle. And um, so, I kept going back to this place after that happened. And um, eventually it started making themselves a little bit more known. You could, you know, because they, once they get to trust you, that's when they'll open themselves up to you. So I went there once and I invited him to my house. I said, okay, if you guys wanna to come to my house, you're more than welcome to come to my house. I'd love to see you. That night, they came to my house and they started tapping on my windows at night. My wife was not too thrilled about this at first, as anyone can imagine, especially being that uh, on our second floor was when they would tap on our windows. And that window was uh, about where that light is right there though. So, and they would always, they would tap on her window on her side of the bed. And she was not happy about that at all. So they'd come to the house and we'd be in bed. You'd hear like a tap, tap, tap on the window like a fingernail. And she would roll over and she'd be like, I hate that. And I'd be like, they're not, you know, it's nothing bad, don't worry about it. So, a lot of stuff's happened between now and then. Um, I've seen a lot of weird things. I don't think it's weird, but you know, most people think it's weird. Um, we've gone to places and uh, we started seeing like the eye glow, the eye shine, um, orbs in the forest and stuff like that. I don't, they're not always related, or they're not, it's not always Sasquatch, but the two are related. The, the phenomena happens in these areas not all the time, but if it does, you just have to be open to accept it and not push it all away. Um, Try to think if I have. I think that's all I got for that. All right. So right now I live in Oregon. I live in Bend, Oregon. I moved to Bend about two and a half years ago, and the um. Moving there, and now I have like a, I get to experience things in Oregon because I've had three encounters, no four, sorry, four encounters in Oregon. I've had numerous in Canada since then, so I keep going, I've been going up there since I was a kid, so I keep going to the cabin every like one or two times a year, and then the stuff that I've had happen here. So I've seen the differences in activities and like the way they interact with people. And the way that they interact here in Georgia is different than how they interact in Canada, and it's different than how they interact in, in Oregon. It's, uh, it's little differences, but say so like here, I've seen a lot of eye shine and like the eye glow, and it's, people like to say that's like paranormal or supernatural. I don't necessarily agree with that. I think that, because they are flesh and blood, like, but they have abilities and there's just no denying that type of stuff to me. So they're not ghosts, they're flesh and blood. So that's what I mean by there's like science and woo. There's like, they mesh together. But the ones in Georgia seem to do these uh, woo things more than the ones that I've experienced in Oregon. In Oregon, they, they like to do tree knocks a lot. They don't show their eyes a lot or as much, um, it's, they're more, they fall into the category of like flesh and blood science type activity. The ones in Canada, uh, it's like a mixture of both, but it's definitely a lot of weird stuff mixed into it. And um, the ones here are kind of the same, but the tree structures here, I had a bunch more stuff, but I wasn't able to get all my pictures here on time. But uh, 
Ginger is going to show you some of the stuff because she, she goes to the same areas that I've gone to. Um, and she's got her own areas. But these, these structures you'll find all over this area. Once you start to like understand what their symbols are, and Ginger has m more of like the asterisks and stuff that they'll leave, that's like their calling sign. Um, you'll just start seeing it all over, but in, it just depends on the trees, you know, and like the areas that you live in. So who here is from West Georgia? Okay. From the 10 years that I lived here and I started researching uh, around 2013, Pretty much from the Chattahoochee River all the way north through uh, Rock Mart, Cedartown, Rome, up to Chattanooga, eastern Alabama, is an extremely active area. They are all over the place. And they can move around right under our noses, and you'll never know if they don't want you to know. But they'll also, they'll make themselves, you know, they'll make you aware if they want to. And a lot of times people take that as aggression. You gotta have to understand, and this takes experience through going out and like learning their ways, and like learning how they are, because now when they approach, they'll, they'll usually send, like you can usually sense when they're around, you can feel their energy. And this has to do with like your heart's electromagnetic fields and, and, uh, and stuff. There's been a lot of studies that have been done on these things. But, so basically your heart has an electromagnetic field that produces like a, kind of like an energy around you. Well, they have this too. The difference is theirs is really strong and it puts out a lot of energy. And some of you have probably experienced this when, you, when you're just standing there and you'll get the chills for no reason or, you know, like goosebumps and you might hear like a buzzing, crackling sound in the air. Or you can just feel it, like I usually just feel it in my chest. And that's how you feel when they're around. But some people don't pick up on these things. So if you're out and you're researching or you're walking through the woods and you don't pick up on these like signals they'll give out, they might like break a tree branch or push a tree over or something to that nature. And that's normally, for me, that's like a, hey, I'm here. You're not here, you know, like you're not picking up on my, on my little sign, so I'm gonna just snap, break this tree branch. Most people would take that as like, like they're warning me to get out of here, which I guess sometimes it could be, but most of the time it's not. Most of the time it's just like them announcing themselves. Um, but they do things like that. I mean, they'll, they'll push over an entire tree. I had this happen to us once when we were camping and my wife was not happy about it. But um, the misinterpreted aggression thing, just don't, go out there and if you hear a tree, bra tree branch like be snapped in half or a, if a tree gets pushed over, don't automatically assume that means that they're coming to get you because it doesn't. It just, sometimes it's just a little one that's playing a joke on you, you know? They, uh, the juveniles like to uh, play jokes and they'll definitely get jump scares out of you. And so you have to kind of have a sense of humor, you have to be open-minded about these things because if, if you're walking and at night, you know, you're already kind of nervous and one runs up to you, bluff charges you, and stops right there, right right on the side of the trees where you can't see them. It doesn't really necessarily mean that they're trying to scare you out of the area. They might just be trying to get a good laugh out of you, out of your expense, you know, and that's happened to me plenty of times. I mean, but they're not trying to kill you. It's like this is all, mis uh, most of the time this is misinterpreted. Like I said, if you're out there with respect and you're just being nice, and just out there trying to interact with them, this is the type of activity you're gonna get. This is what most people want. But you, you gotta keep your fear in check with this stuff. So that's one of my, uh, my big things too. All right, we got a few minutes left. I had a bunch of stuff that I was gonna get more into like the energy stuff, but um, I'm gonna have to hold off on that. If anybody wanna talk to me about that later, we can. I don't like, I like evidence, like the scientific trying to get evidence and stuff like that, like footcasts are awesome. Um, my personal favorite thing to do is get audio, like I love audio, because you can learn so much from audio, like, because they'll actually work with you on audio recordings too, so if you go out and you set your audio recorder out, they'll work with that, because a lot of times they don't want to be seen, and they don't really want you to see them, because like from my experience when I was a kid, when I saw one, it scared the crap out of me. 
it, they don't want that. They just want to, um, I don't know, they just don't want you to be scared most of the time. So they'll work with audio recorders and they don't really mind them, but if you're going out and you're gonna put one out, just ask, like, because they're usually there. If you know that if you go into an area and they're there, and you know they're there, then just talk out loud to them and just ask them, like, you mind if I set this audio recorder out? If you don't want me to, you can turn it off. And they will, trust me. If they don't want it on, they will turn it off. And, you know, they'll take that and they'll do what they want with it. And I've got hours and hours, a lot of hours of audio recordings. And I couldn't load them all up here because it would take forever to try and distinguish them. But when I start taking them to the cabin in Canada and I'd set the audio recorder out every night. And uh, at first they would, when they come close to it, it, it would, it's, like a, a like an electric buzzing sound sometimes if their energy's up real high, and um. But then they started getting used to it, and sometimes they would cut it off after a couple hours, and sometimes you'd hear them come up, and they let it go, and then. It would just go through the night of, it would just run the gamut every night. You know, they would there's like a we have a burn drum up there, and uh, they would come up and tap on the burn drum. They'd whisper to each other. Um, they'll break branches and snap sticks and you can hear them just doing all sorts of stuff and these are also things that you hear at night while you're camping up there and uh, try to think of hold on one second sorry my whole my thing got thrown off by all this time I had a whole bunch of stuff, so I was trying to go in order of these things, but it got kind of thrown off on all this stuff. But, uh, yeah, that's about it. All right, so basically, just keep an open mind. Um, I've seen three during the day now, like I've had three daytime sightings, and I've had numerous nighttime sightings. You will probably have a better chance of seeing one at night, because that's when they're most comfortable coming out and getting a little bit closer to you. So. If you go out at night and uh, just control your fear, because if you go into it with fear, you're going to have a fearful experience. You're going to be scared. If they break a tree branch you're, and you're already scared, you're, you're going to freak out. So you have to kind of like keep yourself in check, control your fear, and you'll have a good experience. Be respectful. Act like you would in a stranger's house when you're in the woods with them. Talk to them. Don't feel goofy if you're just out walking through the woods talking out loud. Because nobody's really there to look at you anyways, except for them. And, but they like that, they, they receive that well, they respond to that very well. Um, get your evidence if you wanna try. From my experience, it doesn't work. Um, they will let you do audio, but when it comes to trying to get pictures or um, stuff like that, if, if you're gonna put all your focus in that, you're not gonna get very far. Just go out, enjoy the woods, enjoy the experience, take everything in, just be open, because it's gonna come to everybody in a different way. Some people see them more, some people experience the weird stuff more, some people get a combination of both. So if you go out and you're not getting what you expect to get, just be receptive to everything, because it, it'll come in a different way.